Hello again, it's Cliff from Down Under. We're going to do a little bit of spark eroding now. We're going to spark erode some tiny holes in these tiny steel balls, these little F SKF hardened steel balls, which are the tips of the stylus. Um, pity it wasn't a big electrode that I could show you more clearly because we're talking a, um, an electrode that's 2.3 millimeters diameter. But anyway, it's important that there's holes in these little steel balls because um, we want to actually mechanically connect the stylus stem to the steel balls. It's not good enough in this situation just to, to glue them on as some manufacturers do, glue the tips on the end of the styluses. You actually need the, a little spigot between the stylus stem and the steel ball uh, so that it's really strongly connected because the whole point of it being an impact tolerant touch probe is that it can stand being crashed without breaking the little steel ball off the stem. So I'll just take you through the process of spark eroding tiny little holes in hardened steel balls. Okay, so let's talk about the eroding process. So let's draw the electrode. This is a, about 2.3 millimeters diameter. And the work, the steel ball, let's draw it coming around here. And there's a gap called the spark gap between the work and the electrode. And this is the, um, the eroding surface here. And this is, uh, if you magnified it enough, you'd see there's a whole lot of little craters and as the electrode moves down into the work, it discharges current that melt out tiny little craters of metal. So you've got the current jumping down to the highest point between the electrode and the work and melting out a little crater of molten metal. And that little crater of molten metal has little is a little particle that's or a series of particles that are floating in the fluid and they work their way out. But the problem with the eroding process is that these particles very rapidly build up between the electrode and the work and clog up and cause shorting and arcing and issues that stop, stop the process from operating smoothly. So the secret with spark eroding is to find a way to get those little particles out of the way, to flush them out of the way. The whole, the whole system is immersed in dielectric fluid, but they don't float out rapidly enough and frequently become bogged down inside that spark gap. So the idea is, in this case, there's an insert inside the electrode, perhaps that long, just for explanation purposes, with a tiny little flap filed on each side, and there's a suction applied which sucks the dielectric fluid and the little particles of metal out, the soot particles, of that critical area and evacuates it and reduces the amount of contamination in there so that the eroding process can operate smoothly. And, and getting those sort of adjustments right, the gap that's wide enough there to draw the fluid through, but not so wide that there's not enough electrode there and then you would get a kind of a spike if there was a big gap there of of uh, work where the um, the eroding wasn't happening and you'd have a stalactite going up inside the electrode so getting those proportions correct and getting the flushing pressure correct so that the spark eroding process can operate smoothly are the key factors in spark eroding okay so spark eroding the holes in the little steel stylus tips. The stylus tips are four millimeter steel balls, good quality SKF hardened glass hard steel balls and in order to mount them securely ooh, there's a limit to how close you can zoom in here um, which is about there I think there's a little hole being spark eroded in there of about 2.3 millimeters diameter and about 2.8 millimeters deep. So I'll just take you through the a process of setting up and eroding, which is quite a fascinating process to cut hardened steel. Okay, well let's start the eroding. 
We've got the electrode set over the work, the little 4mm steel ball. We've got that positioned with the help of the digital readout. We've got the electrical settings optimized. We're on 2 amps and um, about 150 volts and we've set the electrical on time and off time and the mechanical on time and off time and the speed of operation and flushing and so on. Um, we've set the uh, vacuum to a very gentle suction to draw the particles out from between the electrode and the work. We've uh, raised the, the dielectric fluid level up above the work. So let's switch it on now. Sorry, I'm making adjustments at the same time as trying to film, which is always a bit of a compromise. I'm trying to get that fluid level low enough to give a good film. So at a, with those settings, the uh, vacuum is drawing enough of the eroded particles away from between the electrode and the work to allow the process to operate smoothly. If the vacuum is set too strong, then it starves the uh, process and fix the spark. If the vacuum's not set strong, strong enough, then the uh, particles begin to clog up between the electrode and the work and cause um, arcing and shorting and other problems. So it's just a matter of getting all of those settings optimized and then the process can be relatively smooth. You can see the process quite graphically here with the dial indicator showing it progressing down. You can see with each strike moving about perhaps a quarter of a hundredth of a millimeter and when it reaches depth it contacts through uh, a micro switch is contacted through the dial indicator stem which is set in position by this uh, digital micrometer. So it's set at 2.86 deep at the moment, so the electrode will erode a hole of about 2.91 because there's a small amount of additional depth and diameter due to the electrode spark gap. And with very low settings and low amperage settings like this, the spark gap can be as small as uh, 1 to 2 thou. See how close I can get without I'm just getting the hang of my new camera without it actually blurring out. But you know, it's a tiny little part, four millimeter steel ball with a 2.7 diameter. That's just blurred out, isn't it? 2.7 diameter copper electrode. So it's not an ideal example of spark eroding to film. So we're on ball number three now and um, it's going really well. Okay, so I've drained the fluid out now. Let's just have a look at how it's progressing. I've drained the fluid out of the way so that it's dry. Let's have a close-up look at the balls. You can see three balls have got little holes eroded in them. Can't get much closer than that. Um, the electrode wears as well as the, as well as the work. Um, if the settings are optimized, you might get about 90 six or seven percent work erosion and three or four percent electrode erosion. The electrode um, breaks away on its sharp corners and so what will probably need to be done in this situation is to uh, rough out the uh, holes and then take the electrode out and machine the end off sharp again and go back and just finish the bottoms of the holes to get a nice parallel square bottom hole in the uh, stylus tips. Just the thing with suction eroding is that the electrode and uh, suction lines can eventually become slightly blocked up 
with the soot and you need to reverse the flow and put a bit of pressure in the other way and you can see the soot evacuating and the gas bubbles evacuating out now that are blocking up the line. Um, you can also erode like this with pressurized fluid going through the electrode and in some situations it just works better that way with um, fluid uh, dielectric fluid pressure rather than vacuuming and sometimes you need to experiment to find the best application of flushing but as old spark eroders will say the three most important things to know about spark eroding is flushing, flushing and flushing so just finishing up now um, while a spark eroder might seem like a very specialized machine to some of you small shops and hobbyists working with hardened steel or with internal right angled shapes should consider a spark eroder because there's probably a surplus of them on the market at the moment there was a lot bought uh, a few decades ago uh, for industry um, that are now standing idle um, because CNC machines have taken over a lot of their workload um, and a machine that was built in Taiwan um, for 10, 20, 30,000 US dollars could be available uh, in quite good condition for just maybe $2,000 or $3,000 and so there's some real bargains out there so it's worth keeping it in mind if you have that specialized need and thanks for watching.